Good evening. Our order of service this evening, the order of Compline, the prayer at the close of the day. Um, just follow along as it's printed in the bulletin for you. Our first hymn this evening, number 424, and as we prepare for worship, the ringing of the bells. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. It is good to give thanks to the Lord. To herald your love in the morning. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and of one another. Holy and gracious God, I confess that I have sinned against you this day. Some of my sin I know, the thoughts, words, and deeds of which I am ashamed. But some is known only to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask forgiveness. Deliver and restore me, that I may rest in peace. By the mercy of God, we are redeemed by Jesus Christ and in him we are forgiven. We rest now in his peace and rise in the morning to serve him. 
Blessed is the man who fears the Lord. His offspring will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house. And his righteousness forever. Light dawns in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with the man who deals generously and lends. For the righteous will never be moved. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is steady. He will not be afraid. He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. The wicked man sees it and is angry. He gnashes his teeth and melts away. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen.
reading from the account of the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ drawn from the four Gospels. When they had bound Jesus, they led him from Caiaphas to the Hall of Judgment and gave him over to Pontius Pilate, the governor. It was early. The Jews did not go into the judgment hall so that they might not be defiled, but might eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. So Pilate said to them, Take him and judge him according to your own law. But the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death. Thus the word of Jesus was fulfilled signifying by what death he should die. The charges they brought against him were, we found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding us to pay taxes to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. So Pilate entered into the judgment hall and called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Do you say this for yourself, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have given you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would fight that I should not be given over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this world. Pilate said to him, You are a king then. Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. I was born and I came into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. But Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in this man. But the chief priests kept laying one charge after another against him. But Jesus answered not a word. Pilate questioned him again, saying, Do you answer nothing? See how many charges they lay against you. Jesus answered him not a word, and Pilate was utterly amazed. He said to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no case against this man. Then they press their charges more vehemently. He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place. When Pilate heard them mention Galilee, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. When he learned that he belonged in Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him on to Herod who was also in Jerusalem for those days. When Herod saw Jesus, he was delighted, for he had long wished to see him because of what he had heard of him, and he hoped to see him do a miracle. He questioned Jesus repeatedly, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the scribes stood there and vehemently accused Jesus. Herod and his soldiers mocked him, they put a splendid robe on him and sent him back to Pilate. Now Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that same day. Before this, they had been at enmity with each other. Pilate then called together the chief priests and rulers and the people and said to them, You have brought this man before me as one subverting the people. See now, I have examined him before you and have found nothing in this man guilty of any of your charges against him. And neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Mark this, he has done nothing worthy of death. I will have him punished and release him. Now, it was at the feast the governor's custom to release to the crowd any one prisoner for whom they asked. They had then a notorious prisoner named Barabbas, who was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during an insurrection in the city. Pilate knew that it was out of malice that the chief priests had handed Jesus over. Therefore he said to him, Do 
do you want me to release for you Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? The chief priests and elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. Pilate asked them again, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they all cried out together, saying, Away with this man! Release for us Barabbas! Now, while Pilate was sitting in the judgment seat, his wife sent him a message. Do not have anything to do with that just man. I have suffered much over him today in a dream. So Pilate addressed them again, for he wished to release Jesus. He said to them, what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? What shall I do with him whom you call the King of the Jews? They all cried out, crucify him. Pilate said to them, why, what evil has he done? I have found no guilt worthy of death in him. I will punish him and then let him go. But they cried out all the louder, crucify him, crucify him. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers of the governor led him away into the praetorium. They gathered the whole band of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a purple robe on him. When they had woven a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. They knelt down and did him homage. Pilate went out again and said to the Jews, See, I bring him out to you that you may know that I find him not guilty. Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I do not find him guilty. The Jews then answered him, We have a law, and by that law he ought to die, because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was more afraid and went again into the judgment hall and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you or power to release you? Jesus answered, You would not have any power at all over me unless it had been given to you from above. For that reason, he who handed me over to you has the greater sin. This prompted Pilate to go on trying to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king sets himself against Caesar. Now when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was the preparation of the Passover, about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but rather a riot was underway, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this man. See to it yourselves. Then all the people responded, His blood be on us and on our children. Then Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, gave sentence that it should be as they demanded. He released to them Barabbas, for whom they asked, the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder. He had Jesus flogged and then gave him over to their will to be crucified. The soldiers mocked him, stripped him of the purple robe, put his own clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. O Lord, have mercy on us.
reading from the letter of St. James, the second chapter. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you, the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, has also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. O Lord, have mercy on us. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, God of truth. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, amen. When Jesus is asked which is the greatest commandment in the law, he answers that there are two. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. By giving this answer, Jesus is not pitting the commandments against each other, which possibly was the intent of the question asked by Jesus' opponents. But rather, Jesus, in giving this answer, summarizes all of the commandments, all of the law. To fulfill the law of God, Love God and love your neighbor. That is, love God, the creator, and love the people of the world whom God has made. If we look closely at the Ten Commandments, we can see that the Ten Commandments can be divided up according to these two categories. We have spent the first half of the season of Lent talking about what we call in the Catechism the first table of the law. 
the commandments that fall under the category of love God. How is it that we love God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength? But to reject all other gods, keeping the first commandment, to not misuse the name of God, but to call upon it rightly in prayer and praise and thanksgiving, the second commandment, and to remember the Sabbath day to gladly hear and learn the word of God, the third commandment. The rest of the commandments, what we call numbers four through ten, all fit into the second table, the second category, love your neighbor as yourself. And if Lent were ten weeks long, we would have the time to take each of those commandments one at a time. But as it is, we are already more than halfway in the season of Lent. Uh, Easter is approaching closely, and so this evening we consider them together as a group. How do we show love for our neighbor? To honor our father and mother and those in authority over us to recognize that authority is given by God on earth for our good. That we would do harm to ourselves if left entirely alone and entirely without guidance in the world, without authority over us. So God provides authority to us and commands that it be obeyed. The fourth commandment. The fifth commandment is you shall not murder. Human life is valuable. Human life is precious because it is created by God. Because it is created in the image of God. Remember that from Genesis 1. God made man in his own image. There's nothing else in all creation that God uh, says that about. And so human life is valuable, it is precious, it is meant to be honored, it is meant to be protected. It is not for us to decide who lives and who dies. That belongs to God alone. The sixth commandment is you shall not commit adultery. And what does that mean but to honor marriage? The union of one man and one woman for life. God's institution of the family. Again, an image of God's creation as God creates them male and female, the woman from the side of the man to be a helper to the man. And God blesses them and says, be fruitful and multiply. And so God establishes the family, desiring that husbands and wives remain faithful and loving to each other. The seventh commandment, you shall not steal. As God has created us, God also preserves the life that he has made. And so we speak of property, possessions, as blessings, as gifts of God, as ways that God provides for us, giving to us what we need to support us in this life. Food and drink and clothing and shoes and house and home and all the, the, the things that we need to support us in the body. And also for us to, to take care of our responsibilities, to give our offerings, to help provide for the church on earth, to assist those who are in need, to care for our husbands, our wives, our children, our grandchildren, to fulfill our responsibilities to those in authority, etc., etc. To steal is ultimately to deny this gift of God, to take what God has not given or specifically to take from someone else what God has given to them. 
The eighth commandment, you shall not bear false witness. You shall not lie, but speak the truth. Uh, it, is, uh, the rep- it is reputation, a good name, that is the gift of God upon his people. And how are good names, how are good reputations ruined by lies, by slander, by gossip, by rumor? by deceit and manipulation in what we say to one another, how we do harm to one another, not only in the body, but also in our words. The ninth and tenth commandments you shall not covet. Covet meaning want or desire for things that We're not supposed to have things that God has not given to us. Rather, we are to be content with what God has given, to attend to our duties and our responsibilities as God has given, and not to step outside of that, and certainly not to lead others into sin. Again, all of these things, reflections of God's creation, how we care for one another, how we show love to our neighbor, recognizing how God has made us and how God has made our neighbor, how God has made the world and desires it to be run, to honor authority, life, marriage, property, to speak the truth, to be content. And so it is, as I said a few weeks ago, when we spoke of the first commandment of having no other gods, that the most common idol in the world, the most common false god in the world is self. It is, and I I don't think I'm exaggerating by saying this, it is the religion of the world. It is the the primary religion in America in the year 2023 to love yourself. That is what we are told. That is what we are taught. That is what our culture tells us to do. Love yourself. Follow your dreams. Indulge your hopes, your wants, your desires. Do whatever you want. Do what makes you feel good. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Don't let anybody uh, disagree with you. Don't let anybody challenge you. Don't let anybody uh, call you by a name that you have not given to yourself. This is sin. To love ourselves more than God and more than our neighbor is sin. To fulfill the law that God has given is to love our neighbor in addition to loving him. And again, we see this first and foremost, particularly in families. As husbands and wives are each called to love the other, to care for the other, to provide for the needs of the other first before themselves. It is the same command that is given to parents to look to the needs of their children and provide for the needs of the children first before their own needs. And so to the children is given the command to be obedient to their parents, to do what the parents command them to do instead of what they want to do. Everyone in the family has this responsibility, just as it is in the church that we look not to our own wants, our own feelings, our own desires, but we look to the word of God, to the commandments that God has given, to who God is and what God has done for us to show us who we are and how we ought to be. Love your neighbor as yourself. Remember also, in Genesis, in the creation, 
that the Lord looks upon Adam and says, it is not good for the man to be alone. And we usually think of that when we, when we hear that verse, that it is not good for the man to be alone. We think of the benefit that we gain from others. We think of how others can be helpful to us. We think of how our lives are better because we have families, because we have friends, because we have neighbors, because we have a congregation of brothers and sisters in Christ. We think about what others can do for us, how others can help us in life, and how our lives are better for it. And that's not bad. That's not wrong. But remember also when God says it is not good for the man to be alone, it is also because of this commandment, because of this duty, this responsibility to love your neighbor as yourself. It is not good for the man to be alone because to be alone is the temptation of selfishness the temptation of indulging lust and greed and pride and all the other sins that come with putting yourself ahead of everybody else. And so when God says it is not good for the man to be alone, we ought also to be thinking about how we serve our families, how we serve our neighbors how we serve our friends, how we serve the church, how we serve in our vocations. What are our duties? What are our responsibilities? What do we owe to our neighbor? How is the rest of the world? And maybe that's thinking too big, but how are the people in our families, our friends, our neighbors, etc., how are their lives better Or how can we make their lives better by what we do? What we say, how we can help with the gifts and talents and abilities and blessings that God has given to us. How do we serve our neighbor in works of love? That is the great commandment, to love your neighbor as yourself, to look to the needs of the others, to have that that same humility, that same attitude of Christ, who came not to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. And particularly when we hear the passion account, when we hear of the suffering and death of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember that everything that happens to him, everything that he says, everything that he does, or, you know, the way we think about it in our our minds, right? Everything that he could have done differently but didn't, right? Could Jesus have escaped? Could Jesus have run away? Could Jesus have come down from the cross? Could Jesus have fought the Jews, the Romans, and everyone? Yeah, sure. But everything that Jesus does, he does not for himself, but for us. He does nothing to save himself, but goes willingly to death for you. To save the world, to rescue the world, to rescue you from sin and death and the power of the devil. So great is the love of God, the love of Jesus, not for himself, but for you. To suffer all of those things, to forgive your sins, to rescue you from sin, death, devil, and hell, to give to you life here in this world and forevermore in the heavenly kingdom. our life in obedience to God, our life in love for God and in love for neighbor is merely a reflection uh, of that love that God has shown 
to us. May God help us, first and foremost, to trust in him, to believe in him, to receive that life and salvation from him, and by it to be strengthened in our lives, to love him and to love one another. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Keep me as the apple of your eye. In righteousness shall I see you. Almighty and everlasting God, for our many sins we justly deserve eternal condemnation. In mercy you sent your dear Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to win for us forgiveness of sins and everlasting salvation. Grant unto us true repentance, that we may ever be dead to sin and raised up by your life-giving forgiveness. Grant us your Holy Spirit, that we may be ever watchful and live true and godly lives in your service. Let us pray to the Lord. O Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, for our sakes you humbled yourself and took upon yourself the form of a servant. We implore you to govern us by your Holy Spirit, that we may never be offended at your humility, 
but heartily believe that by your obedience, even unto the death of the cross, you have redeemed us from the wrath of God and from eternal death. Keep us steadfast in such faith and in Christ-like humility that we may be exalted with you and be made partakers of your glory. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Guide us waking, O Lord, that awake we may watch with Christ. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless you and keep you.
good evening uh, and welcome once again to all of you. Um, just a note on the upcoming schedule. Uh, next week, uh, Wednesday, will be the fifth and final uh, Wednesday evening service uh, during Lent. Uh, it will also be the examination of confirmands uh, in preparation for confirmation on Palm Sunday. Uh, and then the week following, the sixth week uh, in Lent, there is no Wednesday service, but we have services uh, Monday, Thursday at 7 and Good Friday uh, at 7. Uh, and then our usual or traditional uh, Sunday morning schedule, or, or Easter Sunday morning schedule, um, uh, sunrise service at 7, uh, Easter breakfast at 8, Sunday school at 9, and uh, divine service with Holy Communion at 10. Uh, all of that will be in the bulletin, in the newsletter, um, with all the dates and times for those services. So please pay attention to that. But again, next week, um, the last Wednesday service with the uh, examination of confirmants. Have a good night.